Hello, everybody, and I'd like to welcome you to the Criminal Justice Net Network uh, INCJ Seminar 2. Uh, particularly warm welcome to our participants today, and also to anyone who might be listening online. Uh, we, you can find us, if you want to find us, on Twitter or on YouTube. We're criminaljusticenetwork.net, and uh, on Twitter, we are INT. CJ Network. And today we've got three guests. We're uh, going to follow the pattern we had last time, where a short introduction, and then we're going to open it up and just see where the conversation takes us. And last time it was pretty lively. We touched on some deep topics, and we hope and fully expect to do the same today. Um, but before we get going, uh, this event is supported by De Montfort University and Dave Ward from DMU is going to kick us off. So over to you, Dave. Well, welcome everybody um, to this uh, to this second seminar. Um, this really is just an uh, official bit. Um, I feel that, in a sense, the welcome and introductions has all been uh, perfectly well covered. In, um, in our introducing ourselves to each other. Um, just to remind you that um, we've, we've worked together at, at De Montfort, at the university, um, to develop these two webinars um, as really a platform with, for people to exchange ideas and which will be the first stage of building an international network um, in which people can exchange knowledge and, and, and skills and develop, um, develop their ideas about policies across international boundaries in the, uh, in, the, in the criminal justice field sketched in the widest way, uh, in the widest way possible. Um, as John says, we, we had a very lively exchange in the last webinar, and uh, I anticipate that it will be the, the same today. So, um, from the university, to say that you're very welcome. It's great to see you all on screen, and let's go. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Well, um, our first presentation is going to be by Nick Glynn. Uh, Nick has a history as a senior police officer. Um, he's currently working for the Open Society and in, has done very important work on stop and search. Uh, we were teasing him early on that he's clearly made good use of, of lockdown to have the most impressive hairstyle of us all. Um, I think really that's just jealousy, Nick, so for, forgive me for uh, making reference to the fact that you've uh, clearly done best on, of us all on hairstyles. Uh, I can't boast in that area at all. But what we do know is that you've got an important contribution to make. Thank you very much for your paper. And I'm going to hand the floor over to you to uh, get the discussion started. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, good to see everybody. And uh, thank you very much for the, uh, yeah, for inviting me. Indeed, a bit of a quick shout out to Rob Canton, who I've known for a good number of years. Um, and, um, and we did some sort of key work together when I was uh, uh, leading on stop and search reforms in Leicester when, uh, and, and uh, Rob and colleagues at De Montfort uh, did some research for us, which, uh, which is pretty unique actually. So, uh, so Rob, you have been an inspiration, so I don't mind uh, embarrassing you slightly by mentioning that here. Um, yeah, this is the second seminar and uh, the previous one was great. So it's good to be able to uh, contribute at the start of this one. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience in policing, pick out some of the key elements of the paper, looking at the police family, looking at policing reform, looking at evidence-based practice, uh, and I'll, I'll then comment on my experience of working on police reform internationally and finish with some questions for you, which I hope will elicit some golden nuggets, as we, uh, as we say. Uh, and what I should do is start my stopwatch, because then I'll hopefully stick to time. Um, so yes, I was a police officer for 30 years, 
I've special as you do in the police, you tend to specialize in particular areas, but I did many, many uh, different things in the police, but I specialized in public order, both at an operational and at command level in use of force and police violence. And I always say it depends which end of the baton you are on as to what term you use. Um, on equality and racism within the police and on indeed changing policing from within, which is I think an interesting aspect um, that we'll look at a little bit more in a, in a little while. Two roles that I carried out in the police later on in my service when I was at a more senior level. One was as a field officer for the neighborhood policing program where we were helping forces to implement neighborhood policing properly. And I, I looked after eight forces in the east of the country. Uh, so I got a lot of experience of policing, changing it, um, uh, working on that program. And my last job in policing was at the College of Policing as the lead on stop and search. Having led work in Leicestershire, I then went on to be the lead nationally um, at the College of Policing, again, looking at structural reform. And we'll talk a little bit more about stop and search in a second. So hopefully you've had a chance to, to look at the paper. I think the first, um, uh, the first section of the paper, paper talks about the police family and indeed the strength of the police family. I guess really policing is a family because it really needs to be. When you're under threat, under attack, uh, you need to know that your brothers and sisters are gonna be with you, help you answer the radio, come and come and assist you. Um, and so it really does have a very strong um, camaraderie, a family ethos to it. Um, and that has many good aspects to it. I think one of the challenges that we face when we look at changing policing in what, whether that is a specific policy or more or, or, or practice is that the police really does not necessarily welcome criticism input from outside um it it will it it, it will um gloss over that or it will it will in in some ways seem to accept it seem to be welcoming from it but 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 actually one of the comments that i hear in, in my, my work now often is from police officers is you don't know what it's like you don't know what it's like on the street on a Friday night or wherever else it might be. And actually that's used as a weapon by the police to resist input, suggestions, ideas from outside, from people who don't sit within that policing family. Um, and equally, uh, if you are an individual within the police who is seen to say something or do something against that policing family ethos, uh, that can be uh, quite a challenge uh, for in a number of different ways. So, you know, you can be labelled as disloyal. You can be labelled, as I have been actually in the past, as anti-police, which is incredible when I've spent the majority of my life working for the police and doing positive things for it and have risked my life on many occasions for it as well. Um, so, but 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 that, again, it goes back to this, this, this um, idea that, you know, you don't, uh, you, you, you're not disloyal to your family, that you will, um, they're the last people that you would let go. They are the people that you stick closest to. Um, and, and so I think from a reform, a reform a development point of view, that's not an unsurmountable um, uh, barrier, but it's certainly something that we have to be mindful of, I think, in terms of how we navigate that that very strong um, uh, belief within policing that uh, that um, that those outside don't really know what it's like because it's special, because it's unique, um, certainly in the police's eyes. The second point that I'll make and go into a little bit more detail on is policing reform. And I'm using stop and search as an example because it's the one that I know best. It's the one that I've spent the most time in my policing career working on. And whilst I work much more broadly now um, in, in Europe and elsewhere, stop and search all those um, police initiated encounters on the street uh, is a good example of where in the United Kingdom, we've gone through several loops 
of what I would call the same process. And in fact, I gave evidence to the Home Office Affairs Select Committee a couple of weeks ago on the post Stephen Lawrence inquiry recommendations, where, which was 21 years ago, incredibly. Um, and where I said that really we've gone through these loops of development. And this is something I guess that we have to try and avoid where we have a crisis, there's a load of effort then the police sort of re relaxes and thinks that it's sorted that particular issue. The box is ticked. The police moves on. The lessons learned are forgotten. And then another crisis comes along or another push for change comes along and we repeat that process. And certainly as far as stop and search is concerned, we are in one of those cycles now. I helped to introduce the best use of stop and search scheme and the associated reforms in 2014 because there was lots of criticism of unlawful and uh, misuse of stop and search. Reforms took place, use became more managed and more accountable and transparent and now we are seeing it being ramped up again, especially in London. So I think that's a good example of where reforms can happen but unless they're really nailed down in whatever way they need to be nailed down whether that be by legislation or otherwise um you know they can they can uh backslide the third point i make is around evidence-based policing and practice um and just really the the lack of a strong sense in policing of depending on academic research and following it. And what we tend to see is um, a practice based on gut feeling and what seems right and maybe what gets good headlines and not always based on the actual evidence and indeed sometimes going against the evidence. Um, and I think that's another challenge. So the last section then of this really is thinking about how we share good practice, promising practice um, in a sort of an international context. One of the things that I mentioned in the paper is the strength of the English language. Um, and we find this that, you know, a lot of practice is shared between the UK, the US, Australia, Canada, English speaking countries. Far less is shared between us and our much nearer neighbors in France and Germany and elsewhere apart from those materials that are translated into English. Um, and I think that's a real challenge um, and something not to be ignored, even though we're leaving the EU, it seems as though English will still remain the working language. Um, and I think that has some strengths and it certainly has some strengths as far as the UK involvement in that is concerned, but we mustn't, I don't think, I, really, I think we really must um, look for other ways to ensure that things are shared um, in different languages to, you know, to broaden our audience. For instance, if far more materials were in Spanish, then we incorporate a whole another huge cohort of the globe in, in the conversation or in an easier conversation. Um, another point that, uh, that, that I, I guess um, holds us back particularly in Europe, is the lack of equality data. Now in the UK, we have uh, pretty strong equality data. So we're able to at least have an informed conversation about what needs to change and why. In other countries in Europe, that's um, either uncommon or indeed unlawful. And, uh, and I'm actually involved in some work on looking at how we can uh, navigate that and, and maybe improve that situation. Uh, and then I think the final uh, point I'd make is, is around the internal versus the external track in terms of developing uh, and changing policing. Um, and I think you need both. So you need that pressure from the outside that might be strategic litigation. And we've certainly seen some successes where things have gone to court and that's forced the police to change. But by the same token, having advocates inside policing um, to support and drive change is also an important issue. Um, I've got three questions then, because I'm on my 10 minutes according to my watch. So I will go on to just ask you, uh, just to pose these and hopefully these will, these will prompt some, uh, some contributions. 
what are the key similarities and differences between policing and your field of expertise? Um, and secondly, how can we use those to support positive developments and reform in the different um, fields? And finally, uh, and, and this is a sort of a personal one as well. Do you have any insights into how we can best support or promote reform voices from within that don't cost them their career? Because I know that sometimes it can do. Hopefully that uh, has been helpful to you and uh, I will mute myself. Thank you very much very much Nick and for your self-discipline too. Um, okay so uh, the challenge now is to for that to, to flow into uh, discussion um, and two, two questions about uh, policing in your field and what are the parallels uh, and the other about insights and support within and I think policing affects us all and the Black Lives Matter um, experience ricochet, ricocheting from the states uh, into I think probably everywhere in the world every country in the world is is asking these sorts of questions so um, who would like to pick up uh, those questions from Nick and uh, the floor is yours and don't forget to unmute Okay, Vivian, uh, please speak. Yeah, just a couple of quick uh, thoughts. Uh, you know, it struck me as Nick was speaking and when I read his paper that so much of what he wrote and what he said is very particular to policing. And yet when he poses the question in terms of what are the similarities, there are a lot of similarities. Now, I think some of what he described is, is uniquely policing, even in the strength of what he described. So I, I think the... The focus within any organization or profession on the in-group and the family aspect is, is shared, but it's probably not as strong a sense as one gets in, uh, in policing and probably in military uh, circles, but there are similarities. It struck me as well then that uh, one of the other points he made, which I think I also made in my paper or, and our presentation, was the issue about the English language. So I think there are things about that point that need to be addressed, but I think there are, and this was my point about it, for us, there are strengths in that, in that the English, for, for, whether for, for good or ill, is the more commonly shared language. So it, it, it means we miss out on a lot of, of uh, areas that we could touch into if we were more in contact with the other languages. It, and at the same time, it gives us more of a possibility to cooperate uh, with a wider range of people because language has become that international diplomatic and other other uh, language. And I was particularly then interested in the in the comment about or the question about insights on how to promote reform uh, voices from within, uh, because certainly not only in the police, but particularly in the police here in Ireland, we've had that discussion in, in recent years in some very high profile cases and commissions of inquiry uh, that you may or may not have, have heard about and you know it, it, it seems to me it needs in any organization a very uh, specific and concrete focus uh, on making that happen in the sense that you know um, promoting reform voices from within doesn't just happen uh, of its own accord and that it, that it, that it really needs to be uh, actively promoted. And finally, the other bit about the uh, the cycle of crisis to investigation to reform plan to taking the foot off the gas, I think is universal. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Uh, anyone else want to respond? Uh, Bill? B Bill Mather? I think it's a really interesting and important perspective that comes at the sharpest end from police but I agree with Vivian that there are some very common areas. The two things I think are about change really needs cultural change um, and 
so you talk about police families um but policing is about uh public trust and respect and cooperation and that therefore would pose a framework for questioning which parts of the culture are generating the right relationship with public for that trust cooperation and success of policing and which parts are not but the more powerful thing and that is that that's a discussion inside a profession principally is is leadership and the way that one supports the reforming voice is to get that reform expectation um, being projected from the very top and through each tier there are um, people who are engaged in the cultural change that produces public trust that uh, enables the evolution of services in these um, always complex and difficult times. So I, th I think a lot of what, what you were talking, I was thinking you could say that about prisons and prison offices. They don't have the same uh, interface with the general public, but the progress in prisons has been abysmal, absolutely abysmal. Um, and that's because it's not been a cultural change, it's not been an emphasis on the respect and trust and value that comes from the public as much as there should be and there certainly hasn't been uh, what i would term to be good leadership there probation has got a much better positioning um, because it, it started in a different place um, but uh, same principles i think thank you mm -hmm. thank you um rob canton there's a way of raising your hand electronically, isn't there? But I can never find out where it is. Um, <laughs> thanks ever so much, Nick. There's some terribly important questions here. There are just two I'd like to mention, partly in response to Bill. We can talk about the public. But of course, one of the things I think we're discovering since John had mentioned Black Lives Matter is that there is more than one public. And mm. while one public in the United States of America utterly deplores the police behavior, there is another public in America which is, seems to be quite content with what's going on and lacks the, um, well, I think it isn't keen to, to oppose that. So I think that, of course, the police need to win public trust. But what that involves, I think, can be very different for, for different kinds of community. The other thing I want to say is the very important point that you made about how you institutionalize change. And this has been a, a familiar enough experience for those of us who worked on probation in other countries. You have arguments, uh, you win friends and allies, people take up a particular cause and then they leave and then you have to do it all over again. And sometimes those champions are precisely the people that you were worried about, Nick, who risk their own careers, jeopardize their own standing by trying to take a view that uh, that rocks insecure leadership um, and how they're to be supported. I'm afraid I'm just reflect, re echoing your question because I don't know how to do that. But I think the challenge of institutionalizing change to avoid the kind of backsliding that you're speaking about is a neglected aspect, partly because there's often discrete projects. You know, you, you're told you've got to go into this country and do one, two and three. You go in for a short period of time, you come back, report back and say, hey, I've managed to do one, two and three. But there's no continuity. You then walk away. And if things revert, there's a risk of that being somebody else's problem. And some of the international flying consultants, I think, can be guilty of that. Yeah. I'm well, wondering we if we should pick up the use of language issue i mean anna i Can think I you just, just make a comment john sorry um, okay uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, abdul uh, we'll take you first and then anna also wanted to come in so abdul okay. first and then anna sorry again apologies i'm trying to find where the hand is to <laughs> <laughs> it's okay first of all thank you nate that was really interesting i mean i I've, i was sort of giving a little bit of thought around how do you sort of um promotes the reform voices. I think one, one important way of doing that is to diversify the force with the workforce in the first place. 
so in the recruitment and retention of, of um, people in the community that actually reflect the police service in terms of ethnicity, gender, um, and other categories as well. Um, I think it's really important to do that. Reform will only come sort of with, um, reform will only come in a very slow way and it, it's best if it comes from within and the more diverse um, a workforce that you have, the more likelihood you're going to get of being able to kind of bring about change. But it, it also picking up on Rob's point, um, really important that if you diversify the workforce and have voices that are different or approaches and perspectives that are different, that leadership is able to support those uh, voices as well. Leadership is extremely important. Now, leadership can be of two types. Um, mm. the, the first leadership really, I think, uh, how leadership, can support them is it needs to top you know those at the top of the hierarchy if you like supporting these voices but there's another leadership which diverse voices can come in which is about the you know the different perspectives of people with ideas who aren't necessarily leaders in terms of rank mm. but they have real innovative ideas and and thoughts and perspectives which they can bring uh, into it I think one other way which I'm kind of, I'm, I'd be interested to see how kind of um, change can be brought and reform voices. And I think that one positive th thing that's happened in UK policing is the sort of move towards profit professionalization and the introduction of a code of ethics for the police, which only, I think it, became sort of into force around 2014 and 15, yet to be embedded. But for the first time in policing history, you know, we, we're beginning to see set professional standards and, and a code of practice being brought in, where, uh, uh, which kind of hopefully as it gets embedded within the organization more and more, uh, will promote those different voices and give respect to different voices and, and and the whole idea of the code of ethics and its implementation within British policing now is more towards to try and get the police service to be more a reflective and a learning organization rather than uh, one uh, of a blame when something goes wrong and, and, and so on and I think that's a hopeful a start and process to bringing about reform as well, the introduction of a code of ethics um, into a police of service. So people, and, and, and teaching police officers at all levels how to make ethical decisions, because that's the, I think that's the sort of core of policing, making the right decisions at the right times in the right way for the right purpose. And so, again, an introduction of ethics into how we police, it hopefully will be a, you know, a, a step towards the sort of challenges that Nick's highlighted. Thanks, Abdul. Powerful points. Um, we, 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 we've got loads to talk about, and uh, you can see what you've said going here, Nick. I think uh, we'd have just two more contributions, uh, first from Anna, and then Johan wanted to come in. So uh, we just hear those two, and then I think we're going to need to, to move on. But first, Anna. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I found your presentation and article very interesting. Uh, in your paper, you talk about abuse of a stop and search powers. And you also mentioned that today in UK, um, black people are at least four times more likely to be stopped than white counterparts. I do not have uh, specific data from Catalonia or Spain, but I know from when I was working with juveniles and young adult offenders that the situation of disproportionality is the same here. Uh, if you are young from Morocco, living in Catalonia or Spain and commit an offense or a crime, you are more likely to end up in a closed regime institution than other white young people. Um, with this in mind, I'm wondering how the situation of disproportionality is helping to increase what we call secularization and society individualism. 
making young people trustless and promoting them to engage with radical groups who might give them sense of community, sense of belonging and group identity. Uh, things or elements that the current society is unable to offer them. And also another question to reflect would, would be if this is a common problem in different countries, what can be done internationally to implement change, reform, and to improve police interventions? What can be done at an international level? So this is a little bit what I wanted to share with you. Uh, that's, uh, that's a question to which we probably should return. Uh, Yuan, I think you have the last word on this. I need to unmute. Yes, Nick, very good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, just to reflect on the first question that you, you mentioned about the similarities between your presentation and uh, our field and my, my field in, in this discussion is, uh, is probation. Uh, listening to your presentation, I have to say that I was uh, struck to see the word change uh, a, a lot of times. I think you are, you, your presentation is made from this perspective, how you can promote change, how you can reform, how can, who should trigger the change, who should support it, who should inspire it, how the public should support it and so on. And I think from, from this kind of perspective, I think there are a lot of similarities with what's going on in, in, in probation. And I think a very powerful and useful concept in this respect is legitimacy. I think we are also searching for legitimacy in the community sanctions and measures uh, uh, field where we need to find out more about what makes uh, uh, the public uh, and the audience in general accept and approve and support the, the legitimacy of the community sanctions and measures in the, uh, uh, in the community. How can we, how can we work together with uh, the stakeholders towards the same aim and as i say i think legitimacy it's a it's a it's a common concept that we can build on uh both in the police science and also in the probation in, in criminology in general in order to find out more about how we can we can promote reform uh in a kind of sustainable uh and collective way thanks Jan. thank you um nick I really would like to give you the last word. Um, you've um, started off some, I think, profound thinking, challenged us to uh, ask about our own fields. Um, do you have a last sign-off point you'd like to make? Uh, well, firstly, to say thanks, everybody, because <laughs> there's a lot that's come out of that. Um, and, it, and in some ways, it's reassuring to hear some of it, actually. Um, uh, I'll just make a couple of points. A very quick point to Anna. Um, we have an office. I have, I have colleagues who work in Barcelona, so as soon as I can, I'll be visiting Barcelona, and I think we can talk <laughs> a lot more then about um, an organisation that I support, Sos Racisma, who are based in Barcelona, um, who've done some work on disproportionate use of ID checks in Catalonia. So, um, uh, and I think there's an English version of that too that maybe we would, as a network, be able to share. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, lots of good points made. The second thing I'd say is about diversity. It has its place. It's important. It's not a solve all for sure. Um, and interestingly, to just give a football reference, Watford's captain, Troy Deeney, who's been a very outspoken person around the Black Lives Matter movement, said recently, um, it's important sometimes when the black person talks about things um, because they're the only one there, that sometimes they're not always going to be right, just like the white person saying something isn't, you know, that we don't speak for everybody. And I think he makes a very important point there that um, it's good to take views into account, but not to just assume that because it's come from a particular person, it must be right. I think that's an important point to make. Um, I think the last point I'd make is around uh, Johan's point about change and really one of the challenges being that if the police don't see the need to change because things are working fine and they believe it is pr pretty much everywhere, that in itself is a challenge, seeing the need to change and, and being able to highlight that in the first place is, you know, is, is an important step on that route. Um, thanks, everybody. Well, thank you, Nick. And the challenge to us is to change the subject and to follow, follow that. 
but we will, don't worry. Okay, so um, from Nick to Nikki, uh, our next uh, presentation is going to come from Nikki Woods, and rather than have a, a speech or a prepared presentation, uh, we're going to um, introduce the next section of our discussion uh, by uh, having an interview. And so um, let me start by saying this is uh, Nikki Woods, uh, everybody. Um, and I'm going to get her to talk a, a little bit about her, herself and her background first. So, Nikki, tell us first about what your background in international work is. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you again also for um, having me with you. Um, I started off originally as, um, as a journalist with the BBC. Um, so I was with the BBC World Service for about five years doing radio production specifically on Africa. And having been born and brought up in Africa, it was quite a, an easy subject to, to be a winner. So I worked in journalism and then I went down and um, started working as a consultant in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, particularly around HIV AIDS, gender, law, um, various legal changes that were going on in Zimbabwe and South Africa at the time. Um, and eventually I came back to the UK and started working for a UK charity. And this was specifically around health issues primarily um, for women and girls, mother and child health. And this was um, in conflict in post-conflict countries, mainly Central America, um, uh, the Myanmar, Cambodia, um, into China and Laos. And um, then it continued my, my work in Africa. So this was always looking at behavioral change communication. So it's looking specifically at how do you use communication for, um, to, for social change. So it's the use of all sorts of different types from radio to theater in the most remote areas. How do you cope when language isn't, um, you know, isn't uh, shared? How do you cope when literacy isn't um, in, in, in place? Um, the very often we have accepted a very top down type of communication variable and that doesn't necessarily work. In fact, it works very rarely. Um, and when you start incorporating participation and you look much more to get the bottom up um, involvement and empowerment of people, particularly women, um, you find much more effective change. So I worked in that for a long time and then um, got pulled into DFID and became um, central in their information. Oh, so you need to say what DFID is. Department for International Development recently changed and incorporated into the Foreign Office uh, to be effective in September, but it is the Department for International Development. Um, and I started working for them, so the Ministry in the UK, and I worked for them for about three years. Uh, and then that was all having to do with um, a lot of so rebuilding media post-conflict, um, a lot around transparency, governance, accountability. Um, how do you use communication to uh, let people know about changes in democracy and in, in um, the DRC, for example, or um, how do you reshape the um, systems in Tanzania when, when the corruption levels are, um, are rocketing? So all sorts of different topics. So it's how, how do you use all sorts of different communication and media in order to get content that's relevant and appropriate so that people listen, take heed and change behavior accordingly. So that's that sort sounds of to me it. like you've been in sort of quite scary places um, when yeah. uh, societies are quite unstable. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Very. So um, I, I reflected in my, in my um, document about Rwanda um, that was uh, after the genocide where there's a lot of peace and reconstruction that was required, um, reconciliation that was required. Um, working in Somaliland, um, north of Somalia, uh, in the, the Horn of Africa, um, you know, there was unable to go in because we kept getting shot at in our little UN planes and things like that. Um, so yes, it, I tended to work in the more um, unstable um, countries in Burma, well, Burma, Myanmar on the eastern side with um, China, working where it used to be the Opium tri um, Triangle, the Golden Triangle. And there's still a lot of civil conflict there, for example. So what do you do about the women being trafficked in and what do you do about the, the absolutely massive rates of HIV? Um, you know, those sorts of issues and how can you tackle them? How do you let people, people even know that there might be an alternative when they have no access to education, um, no access to, to information about it? 
Um, so what can you start doing to impact change and who do you work with within civil society and public sector, um, usually the health sector there, to be able to implement change? So quite varied. Well, uh, as, my, as my grandchildren would say, that sounds pretty awesome. So let's <laughs> put that as your background. And yeah. can you tell us a little bit about how you got into your current job, which is not overseas, but is based in... No. <laughs> Very much here, and in, in, um, so I live just outside um, Milton Keynes, close to where Bill comes from, and um, I work in in Bedford. So I got involved through conversations. I read a book called um, "The Beekeeper of Aleppo," and it was about um, a mother and husband who came over to Britain and got caught up in the immigration system here. And I thought, really? And then I realised this place was just north of where my children go to school. And I, well, that's just extraordinary. So I applied when we were looking for a CEO and I thought this is, you know, this is, just can't quite be right. Like, we can't possibly treat people this way. Anyway, so I applied to be the CEO of this very small charity that works in Yarlswood, um, helping the women who are detained indefinitely in the UK indefinite detention system. And, um, and it, I think I was just sort of this overall lack of empowerment that women have um, in the detention centers and, oh, in this, there's only one, so in the Arleswood. Um, and it was very interesting, some of the parallels that I found working in some of the most remote parts of the world actually being reflected in the UK detention system. Mm. Um, you know, the, the things that I write about, you know, the lack of access, the lack of empowerment, the lack of assertive, any form of assertiveness, capacity building, all sorts of different things. Um, and I was just very surprised to see it being reflected here in the UK in our you know, part of our criminal justice system. How do you find working in the voluntary sector? I like it. I much prefer it to just earning money and flying in as an international consultant and then flying out again. Because I think, you know, you guys talk about your helicopter consultants that come in to do a piece of work. I don't really see the impact of that. Um, and then leave. In charity sectors, you tend to stay and you stick around and you work jolly hard and you actually see the results. Um, so the programs that I, I again spoke about in my report, um, or Anana, I set up in Rwanda and it's still it's still now an independent, you know, NGO, it's completely self-sufficient. So that sort of achievement is, mm. you know, you're making a difference there. So okay. it's, uh, it's a good one. We could really take ages talking about lots of different aspects of the work that you raise mm. in, in, in your paper. But I'm particularly keen to take uh, on looking at giving women a voice uh, yeah. in justice issues. So what do you think the particular barriers that women face? I mean, it's, it's really difficult for me to talk about justice, given, given the audience looking at, at who's sitting around this panel today. For me to be talking to you about justice seems completely inappropriate, but all I can do is draw on a very small amount of experience in detention, and perhaps you can reflect on, on how it, it can be applied. Um, but what I've really noticed is that the women have much quieter voice in detention than the men. Um, they they just aren't used to being necessarily provocative, and they certainly aren't represented by um, by the media or by uh, voice, as you like. Um, they're hampered by similar constraints with respect to you know, low access, low ownership of um, of a means of com of communication. Of course, that's taken away as soon as you enter Yardswood anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but also, once they get out, their economic empowerment is much less, and of course, often they're separated from their children, which is a whole other different aspect of trauma. Um, these really low levels of, of voice also impact policy and the aspects of policy debate. Um, so that's something else I've certainly recognized. Um, in addition, actually, within the um, detention state, the, the sort of constraints that the masculine sort of patriarchal society has are really quite extraordinary and, and taken for granted. So if you are a woman and you're brought in modern day slavery or human trafficking, you're picked up at two or three o'clock in the morning and you go into Yarlswood. The first person that you're interviewed by is a man in uniform who needs to get all of the information from you. Meanwhile, you're utterly terrified and you've faced trauma at the hands of men in uniform and those sorts of things are reflected time and time again in the detention center that impact women so i do think the violence against women and the sort of trauma that various aspects that they face in detention are not necessarily recognized there was a recent report for example which went to, talked about how um, the age you know the home office felt that it was a very low you know low level issues that 
uniform men can go straight into women's rooms and just you know, ransack them looking for whatever they wish at any time of day. And the women have absolutely no recourse to address that action. And that's a very low level um, issue. Is it really? Can, would we think that's a low level issue? I think that's when someone's faced a lot of trauma in their past that might not be very low level. Mm. So there's sorts of things that are endemic in our thinking about gender um, that, I, that I really think can be drawn parallels from, you know, we need to think about when we're talking about gender issues. The violence against women and the trauma is certainly um, something else that comes into, into it and the separation from children. Okay. So. I mean, in, in your paper, you talk about how having a strategy about communication should be really embedded in international development yeah. work, yeah. Like often sort of uh, forgotten. And, and I'm sure that around uh, the table in our seminar, uh, lots of people are thinking, mm, yeah, maybe we've done stuff that's been f forgotten. I'm hoping people will pick that up. But is, as we finish off yeah. now, is there any, any aspect of your paper you'd like the seminar to discuss in particular? I think it, it is this aspect of, of communication strategies. It's, it's really interesting, Nick, in, in your paper, we've just been discussing, we've just been talking about, you know, promoting voice and looking at um, how do you gain legitimacy? Um, how do you gather the, the audience in to really believe that the, the, what the role of police might be now or in the future and to really sort of trust again? All of those aspects have to do with a communication, isn't it? It's a strategy of how do you get people at the grassroots to listen? I totally get Bill made this point about leadership and having an enabling environment right from the top down, but having a sort of a level of ensuring that a strategy is built into the work that we all do, that, that makes sure that we incorporate the audience in a two-way dialogue so that you can do your top down, but also ensure that you have your bottom up participation coming from the grassroots. So that when we're trying to influence behavior, we're trying to influence people's minds and hearts and that terrible American idea, but you, you really get the audience to be involved in the process process um, and incorporate a, a strategy using media using all sorts of different aspects but listening to what the audience understand first and then talking to them again so it's two-way and it's constant throughout the planning it's really easy if you know how to do it well, um, and here we are using um, a different form of media to communicate uh, Nikki mm. great so thanks okay. and I think the challenge now goes to the rest of us to um, see how uh, we want to use this paper and this discussion to broaden out to different aspects so who would like to pick up the challenge first over to you thank rob canton first please just a very quick one nikki thank you so much that was extremely interesting and in reminding us of things that are too readily taken for granted perhaps particularly by white blokes um i think your some of your very last points about um we, we talk about policy exchange and we talk about sometimes about policy transfer, but everybody knows that translating policy into practice is really, really difficult, even when people share traditions and, and histories and backgrounds. So I just wanted really not to make up any new point, simply to echo yours about the imp supreme importance. Uh, we can change policies. It's easy to change policies. I've been to countries where their policies are brilliant, but actually nothing happens because nobody owns those policies. Nobody really understands them. Um, and the practice just sort of uh, uh, drifts on. So although we've often talked about these things under a heading of policy exchange or policy transfer, practice exchange and practice transfer matters more. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Um, Nick Glynn and then Dave Ward. Nick Glynn first, please. Thanks, Nikki. Um, yeah, great. I, I particularly just want to mention the, the media and the comms strategy element to this and the importance of it, I guess. And um, I, I think maybe a challenge to us all in terms of who does that work, who we get to do that work, whether we do it ourselves, um, how connected people affected by these issues are to that media. You know, what do we want to say? Um, who are those people that we want to say it to? And how do we communicate with them? Um, and, you know, I would, um, I, I would say I have a, a, a lot to sort of learn on this. I find we have a comms department 
um, they're an underused uh, resource. They really are in, in my organization. Uh, and, and something that I might think is a, uh, you know, just a little bit of work that involves this organization in, in Barcelona, for example, or whatever, to me might not be important. But from a media perspective, and to media organizations can be, you know, one of those golden nuggets. It's a story. It's something they can preamble. It's something they can feature. It's something they can reflect back on. Um, and I think we underestimate the um, the value, I guess, of the work that we do and how much more we can make of it by having uh, by making use of media. And I guess the point you really make, Nikki, is having a strategy at the start of any piece of work, of any effort, is a way of maximizing the impact of it by uh, using media to its full potential. Absolutely, Nick. Um, um, powerfully made. Good. Uh, Dave, I think, wanted to come in. Yeah, um, it, I'm, I'm beginning to see that communication and media is a thread which is coming through a lot of the presentation in the two seminars. And I forgot what I want to say, because I think it connects with where Nikki is, is, is working at the moment. But I think it was a point that Anna made um, in her presentation, um, which is, well, we talk about communication and we talk about media, but we have to drill below that and address um, inequalities of provision, i.e. having the hardware and access, having the funds to be able to use that hardware, hardware to, uh, to communicate and to engage. And I, I don't know, it was in Nikki's paper or something I'd read else, elsewhere, which really hit me. Maybe it came out of the uh, um, incident in Glasgow last weekend people talking about asylum seekers and the attention which is given usually to um, kind of life-sustaining provision, um, at somewhere to set a roof over their heads, food to eat, but that perhaps the thing that many asylum seekers say they most need in the community is a mobile phone. <laughs> because without a mobile phone, they're totally disconnected and alone. And I, it was just a comment, and uh, we can talk about the um, niceties of um, the techniques of communication, but we really do have to go right down below that and mm. look at access and inequalities in being able to use communication. Yeah, I mean, I. Uh, access and having a voice if you don't have uh, a, a mobile phone or a way of getting on the internet in the modern age is 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 really rather fatal isn't it uh, abdul has ra 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 raised a hand and also uh, vivian and anna so um uh, can we go uh, vivian and then abdul and then anna is that okay so vivian first then uh, anna then abdul thank you vivian first okay. OK, thanks, John. Yeah, I want to make a similar point of what John has been referring to and what Dave uh, covered as well. Um, and first of all, I, I, I really enjoyed Nikki's paper and presentation slash interview. And it, it strikes me that, we're, you know, we're talking about communication and in a context where I think we're talking about two types of communication. One of them is, I think, what Nick referred to in his, one of his last points there, about the communications unit, you know, the, the, the providing information about what we're doing out to people, out to the media, out to the public and so on. Uh, and that's, that's clearly very important. But I think a lot of what Nikki has been talking about has been the underlying communication. And it, it particularly resonates in the points she made in her paper referring to the issues of ownership, uh, access and relevance and participation. And I think really at, at, at that level the work that you're that you're talking about i think and that we do is really all about communication because 
you know, John made the point about people, you know, being allowed to have access or whatever. I, I, I think it's deeper or it's more than that in the sense that whatever we do is needs to be grounded and founded in appropriate communication within a particular type of relationship. And linking that back to the question and the point Nick made earlier and other people referred to about the, you know, changing the culture uh, within a police organization or another organization and the need for leadership from the top. And then Nikki referred to that as a, a kind of a need, not an either or, but a, a two sides of the coin, the top down versus the bottom up, if you like. But I think it pervades the whole uh, core of, of what we do and how we do it. Uh, you know, and, and that's that type of communication. So it's, you know, when we say communication, we can mean mean different things. But, I, you know, I, I think we, we really need to get into the in, into the bones of that to be really uh, not just effective, but to be right and appropriate. Okay. Anna, next. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, Anna. Yeah. Um, Nikki, I found your article really, really, really interesting and you, your interview as well. Actually, I think that the work you did and the work that you are doing is really wonderful. Um, when talking about owner, ownership, access, participation and communication, we have to bear in mind the gender perspective. It's, it's a key factor to effective communicate. Uh, we have to include all population segments. I actually think that the gender perspective is a question that must be incorporated in all criminal justice interventions and beyond. In your article, you talk about communication. And at some point, I understood that you talk also about female social reference. Regarding this topic, I wanted to mention something that has a huge impact in the education of uh, young people. For example, young boys grow up with very clear masculine references or references, reference on how to behave uh, in what we call from an anthropological perspective, the public sphere. Young boys, they, they always see male politicians, male journalists, male doctors, among others. On the other hand, it is very difficult for young girls to grow up with clear and visible social female reference. And this indeed is having a huge impact on the type of women that these young, young girls will be in the future. What kind of jobs they will have, what spaces of power will be able to reach and so on. The gender perspective uh, should be incorporated in all life uh, aspects and especially when we talk about development of international relations in the criminal justice fields. And the last point is that it's also very important to ha highlight that today, mainly all intervention programs in the field of the criminal justice field are designed for and by white Western men. Mm. When will this change? <laughs> well, there's a challenge indeed. Um, Abdul, do you uh, still like to come in? Uh, you need to unmute. Sorry. Would you like still to come in? Abdul? Yes, please. Yes, please. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes, Go ahead. I, I was just sort of, yeah, thank you, Nikki. That was a really fascinating paper that you did and also fascinating interview there. Um, I just wanted to sort of reflect on a couple of things around uh, building up on what Anne said, which is what I was going to say. So from some of my experience in sort of um, strategic communications and you know to counter violence extremism and so on and the the gender question and uh, giving people ownership of what they want very often um, sometimes this is all about power isn't it but it's also a power a power dynamic that comes in here is, is around when we think that we need we want to achieve a behavioral change it's so important to get the, the target audience or the group or the community in which we want that behavioral change to sort of uh, work with them to, um, to sort of uh, decide how that change and what change is needed and so on. Sometimes I think we're in danger of kind of having our own agenda for change, which might not be the same agenda 
um, that the, the in the community that we're trying to bring about that change. Um, and in terms of the gender um, perspective, I was just reflecting on how powerful um, sort of if we take a country like Libya and so on, and if we look at some of the mediation work being done by women there in that kind of a mm. society, hugely powerful. Um, and, and so we do need to try and again, it goes back to a little bit around Nick's point as well, around kind of um, uh, bringing in, trying to bring in more diverse people and so on. Really important that we empower the voices in the community in which we're trying to bring about that change, but working with them to decide the rate, the pace, the methodology of that change, how we bring, uh, bring about that. It's very often sometimes my experience uh, of kind of um, communication for behavioral change is that there's a sort of arrogance in us in the West in that we want to bring about that change. It's so important for us. We feel it's really important. And we kind of uh, go about doing it in a very clumsy way. Whereas the point that Nikki was talking is bringing on the community in which you want to try and influence that change on and bringing them on to kind of decide the agenda and how it should be done is a much more effective way and dare I say a more acceptable way to others in the community who might be opposed to the particular change that's desired and right as well. Okay, um, we're, we're going to need to move on. Uh, Nikki, you're going to have the last word, which only seems fair. Um, uh, and then we'll have a minute or two break. But first of all, Nikki, do you want just to, to tie any loose ends? I, I think what everyone's points that everyone's made, I think are really relevant. I, I do think this aspect of really developing um, the communication strategy that you do, making sure that the aspects of the, you, you won't be able to get the messages right unless you work with the people who you're trying to impact. In order to reach them very often you have to work with civil society who are working in those communities to ensure that you have it relevant and not being an arrogant diatribe but instead being something that has great value and meaning to those people so there's a lot of different aspects in your common strategy that you have to um, make sure that they're in there to um, make sure what you're doing is actually relevant and is going to make those kinds of changes which are defined by the people you're trying to change because without getting their their um, intelligence on it from the beginning you're, you're going to be at sea and your message might be completely lost and only with that can you then ensure that your messages are correct because they're the ones that have told you what those are and I do also want to just briefly briefly address this aspect that there are many different types of communication strategies you know whether they're external internal strategic etc you know, and how you use a variety of media and comms to do those are critical in that in the comms strategy for development. But um, on the whole, thank you, everyone. I just thought that was a really interesting discussion, very interesting debate. And we probably have only just started. Um, I'm going to suggest we uh, take a minute or two just to, to stretch and uh, make sure that our ears aren't hurting too much. And then we're going to move on to Jan Donescu and looking forward to that. Uh, and I think we need to get a PowerPoint up for Johan, so um, that should be good. So just make sure it's just a minute or two uh, and re relieve your ears, if nothing else. Uh, and, and then we'll start off with Johan's presentation. Thank you. <laughs> 